Good morning. It's great to see you all. If we don't know each other, my name is Jose Diaz. I'm the executive director of finance of Christ Journey. I'm also known as the numbers guy. It's one of these numbers guys. My love language is numbers. Nothing wrong with that. God loves numbers people. God loves numbers. And if you cannot preach or you cannot sing, I guess you can be the numbers guy. So that's what I do. So, um, and what the numbers tell me about Christ's journey, numbers are beautiful in Christ's journey because we are part of a congregation that is very generous. Our congregation is very generous, gives uh, sacrificially, and that allows us to, to take God's message, Jesus' message, all over the world. On the other side, some, some of you are wondering, um, what do we do with the money? I can answer that question. I know the answer. Um, we do great things for God. We are part of a very generous church. We send missions all over the world. We send wire transfers all over the world. We send mission teams. We do church online, 5,000 people all over the world um, get to hear about this because of that. And the list is long. City, um, we serve the city. We feed the homeless. And it gets even better. We're going to go to Miami now. Isn't that, isn't that cool? We're going to Miami Beach. Um, so I'm here just to say that I'm very proud of being part of a congregation that is um, so generous. I'm very proud of a serve for a church that is so generous. So thank you so much for the generosity. And I'm also here to introduce our guest speaker today, the real Chris Brown. Chris has been in the ministry for 20 years, has a lot of experience. He's been senior pastor, executive pastor, campus pastor, you name it. Married for almost 20 years, um, came last year and gave us a great message that uh, really impacted our congregation. So please, let's welcome Chris Brown. What's up, Christ Journey? You guys doing well? Good to hear. Good to hear. Everybody say this with me. Nothing great, Nothing great. was ever achieved. Without, Without enthusiasm. enthusiasm. Yes, what you experience here at Gables, Kendall, what you guys experience online is what you're feeling is enthusiasm about what we sang about. We actually believe that God is so good and we get to celebrate him today. You get out of church what you put into church. And uh, some of you needed to hear that today because you just barely got here. But uh, I get it. I've been there before as well. So I want to welcome Kendall, welcome those of you that are online. And, uh, you know, <laughs> you hinted at it a little bit. Uh, let me just go ahead and get that elephant out of the room. I am uh, very well aware that I'm not that Chris Brown. <laughs> I get it. Everywhere I go, let down Chris Brown. There's gonna be no dancing and no singing today. I apologize, actually that's for you. Uh, there's some things you just can't unsee. <laughs> but hopefully I know a little bit more about the subject matter today than he does. Um, I know I'm much nicer to Rihanna, so we're good there. <laughs> Those of you that know what I'm talking about, you need Jesus. <laughs> Those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, hey listen, just don't Google it. You don't even need to know. But uh, there's a rapper and singer named Chris Brown. And everywhere I go, I mean, I'm checking into a hotel, it's like, Chris Brown, oh. <laughs> I get that look. Rental cars, oh. My wife, it's, no, I'm just kidding. But <laughs> everywhere I go. Anyway, let me tell you a little bit about Let Down Chris Brown before we begin. This is my family in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, we live on a 200-year-old farm, a uh, 30-acre farm that is dilapidated that we're trying to do a little bit of work on but having a lot of fun. That's my wife of uh, nearly 20 years, and those are my three little chitlins. They look innocent, but I, I promise you they're not, not even close. My boys are actually named Max and Jack. I didn't know this, but I prophetically named them Max and Jack, because my life since they've been born has been completely maxed out and jacked up. 
<laughs> I don't have any favorite kids, I promise. I just happen to have a perfect little girl. And uh, she is here with me uh, today. Hey, today's sermon is titled, those of you that are taking notes, the sermon is titled, My Top 10 Political Opinions of 2019. Wouldn't that be awkward? <laughs> that would be so awful. Anyway, uh, today's sermon is really titled, uh, The Fastest Route to True Joy Ever. Anybody here want joy and you want it fast? And those of you that, I mean, those of you that don't want joy, I mean, come on. You're like, I've already got it, Pastor. I'm a blessing. I get it. But man, we're in a today's world where it's like, man, we want joy. No matter what your background is, no matter what your ethnic affiliation is, no matter what your gender, we just want joy. And I'm not talking about just the happiness. I want true joy. For me, I've gone through some battles emotionally, and I just wanted joy. I may have it on Tuesday, but not on Thursday. I may have it on the weekend, but not during the week. The fastest route, as I was trying, I flew into Fort Lauderdale and had to drive down past the county line. All I cared about was the fastest route. And it took me on some weird, weird detours on how to, to get down here. Um, so it reminded me, uh, today as we're looking for the fastest route to joy, today's route may not be what you thought. It may surprise you. It actually has nothing to do with actually looking for joy. Hopefully that intrigues you just a tad. How many of you can remember your 11-year-old birthday? <laughs> All the 12-year-olds in the room are like, yep, <laughs> right? I know it's hard to remember. Some of you are like, I don't know. I mean, think about this. What kind of presents did you get? Did you get like a, maybe a Sony Walkman? Remember? Or maybe some light-up LA gear tennis shoes? Oh, yeah, man. You put them bad boys on with some parachute pants. You are the man. <laughs> maybe a boom box, right? Some of you, it's like black and white TV. I mean, I don't know, but however old you are, but not many of us can remember our 11-year-old birthday, but I can remember my 11-year-old birthday like it was yesterday. I was sitting down on the floor in a dark, empty, roach-infested apartment. Apartment 217, Ocean Villas Apartments, on the corner of Edwards and Warner on the wrong side of Huntington Beach, California. And I remember sitting there in absolute silence. No food, no furniture. I can remember looking out the second story balcony window and wishing that my, my birthday looked much differently. Of course, I was hoping for bounce houses and friends over, laughter, perhaps a little bit of ice cream cake. But instead, this 11-year-old boy was sitting there replaying the last several years of his life. You see, I knew at that point, I, was, I didn't have life figured out, but I knew that several father figures going to jail wasn't part of the family dream. I knew that multiple nights spent sleeping in the backseat of a 1979 Dodge Diplomat was not normal. Abuse shelter to abuse shelter to abuse shelter. I knew that wasn't the way it was supposed to work out. For weeks at a time, spent sleeping underneath the bridge right there at the corner of Edwards and Warner, using my backpack as a pillow. I actually took this picture a couple years ago. I spoke at a, an event called Catalyst out in California. I hadn't been back there in 25 years, and I went back there just to reflect on how good God has been. And I snuck, in, uh, snuck under there and took that picture, and it uh, looks exactly the same as the slept right there on that, on that incline. So I'm sitting there, I'm thinking about this. I'm in the apartment. I can remember turning my attention from replaying all of that to looking into the kitchen. Nothing in the kitchen. No canned goods, no paper products, no dishes, no nothing. The only thing on the counter was a bag of cocaine that my biological father had just dropped off as child support. 
My mom was in the kitchen, a hard-working single mom trying to make ends meet. And I can remember as an 11-year-old boy, the, the, the image that sticks out to me the most is the look on her face, this look of hopelessness. You ever seen it? You can tell it from a mile away, just staring at that back wall, not having any answers about life, just working four jobs, just literally hopeless. And I had a realization that day as an 11-year-old boy, I didn't have life figured out, but I was like, hey, this will never happen on my watch. When I get older, man, the curse ends here. When I get older, this will never happen to my family. Speed the story up a little bit. Went through middle school, went through high school. I have absolutely no idea how, but by the grace of God. I, would be, I was drowning myself in sports, fall, winter, spring, football, baseball, basketball, doing everything I can to stay away from home and to find a coach, a father figure who will say, I'm proud of you. You do that long enough and you do 500, 400 reps when everyone else is doing 100 reps and you get the first one to practice, last one to leave, you end up, even a below average athlete can become pretty good. So I got a college scholarship to play baseball at a Christian school even though I had no idea who Jesus was. They said, I'll give you $50,000. I said, I'll love Jesus all day long. <laughs> so I went to this Christian school, had no idea what I was doing, but I found out two weeks into the school that Psalm 68 says, I am the father to the fatherless. And I met my father that day. Then after that, I met my bride, Holly. You know, you get Jesus and you get the Holy Spirit and then it kind of goes from there. <laughs> We graduate, we start our life together, and we're just killing it. I mean, let's, adult stuff is so easy. I mean, we've just got it. We've got it made. We're rocking it. Got two good jobs, living on way less than we earn, which means we're a unicorn. And uh, we put all this money aside, and we're like, oh, my goodness, what do we do with all these savings? Let's go ahead and buy a house. So we bought a house with cash, and then we sold it three months later. And we made $30,000 in extra money in three months. And we're like, woo, that felt good gave us a little warm and fuzzies, like we're gonna do that again. So we did it again, and we did it again, and we did it again, we were just rocking it, and we're getting all puffed up, we're amazing, we're so smart, this adult stuff is so easy. <laughs> of course, we knew everything we could ever need to know because we're 22. <laughs> Until one day I decided, why in the world would I wanna flip one house at a time when I can flip eight? So I walked down to a mortgage office and I borrowed a million dollars. The year? Too soon, too soon. 2007, I don't know if you're laughing at me or laughing with me, what's going on here? <laughs> Kendall, they're being mean to me here. Uh, man, it's tough. So, I couldn't rent these houses, I couldn't sell these houses for the next 36 months. Everyone say 36. 36 months, I paid nearly 10 grand a month every 30 days for 36 months on empty, vacant homes. Until January of 2011, I walked into a filled courtroom. I looked a trustee in the eye, explained my situation, and because I lived in the South, she looked at me and she said, bless your heart, <laughs> which is code for, you're an idiot. <laughs> I filed bankruptcy. You're looking at a guy who filed bankruptcy. I said I would never do that to my family, and here I was, I did the same exact thing to my family. My biggest memory of that day was not the filled courtroom. My biggest memory of that day was before I ever left for the courtroom looking into my own bathroom mirror because do you know what I saw? The same look of hopelessness that I saw on my mom's face decades before. Why do I tell you that story? That was really encouraging, Chris. Who, who brought this guy in? <laughs> Listen, I've been through some stuff. Raise your hand if you've been through some stuff. I've been through some stuff. In that time, my wife and I lost three out of our four parents to tragic deaths, two miscarriages. Been through some stuff. When people ask me about my past, they say, Chris, how do you process that? How do you go through that? And this is what I tell them. You can either be resentful or you can be grateful. You have a choice. You can be resentful or you can be grateful. Those of you that have chosen to be resentful, how is that working out for you? We have a choice. So today, 
we're gonna talk about the fastest route to true joy ever. Emphasis added. And this is gonna have three turns in it. So I was thinking through the GPS, going from uh, Fort Lauderdale Airport to here, I'm thinking about like turns and routes, and I'm like, if I could just give everyone three turns to make in their life, to find true joy and to keep true joy, this is the turns that I would give you. This is the things that have worked for me, how to process the pain and not become resentful. Number one, number one is you've got to relinquish control. You're not in control. I mean, time and your relationships and money, no matter what aspect of your life, you're not in control. The Bible says in Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's. Everyone say the Lord's. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the fullness thereof and all it contains. That's what the Bible says. It's all God's. When you look up the original word for the word all, do you know what it means? All. All. It means he owns everything, everything that you can touch, everyone you could ever talk to, he owns, you're not the owner. So if you're not the owner, what are you? Good question, you guys ask really good questions. Doesn't that feel good that you're not the owner? You shouldn't have that pressure. So in every business, right, in a business or an organization, there's an owner and then there's a manager. That's what we are, we manage for the owner, we manage for the king of kings and the lord of lords. What a privilege, we should be filled with so much gratitude that we get to, not have to. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 4, 2, those who have been entrusted to be managers must prove faithful. Faithful in those relationships, faithful in time, faithful in money. What does faithful look like? I'm gonna direct your attention to Matthew chapter 25, 14 through 30. This may be a passage that's familiar to some of you that have been in church in a while, uh, for a while called the parable of the talents or the parable of the bags of gold. And I would just ask that it, no matter whether you're familiar with this passage or you're not, that you would kind of sit back and take this in, not as a narrative of some story that happened back in the day. This is Jesus speaking to our soul this weekend. And he wants us to really uh, recognize who we are in this story. Spoiler alert, you're not the master. You're one of the three servants. And you gotta ask yourself, how well am I managing time? How well, how well am I managing relationships? How well am I managing money? Not my money, but God's money. So check this out. Ask yourself, who am I in the story? Again, it'll be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. It's exactly what God's done for us. He's entrusted all this to us. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one, one talent, or one bag of gold, each according to his ability. Don't miss that. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five bags of gold, or five talents, went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. Boom! So also the one with two talents gained two more. Boom! But, wah, 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 the man who had received one bag of gold or talent went off, dug a hole in the ground in his master's mind. Didn't do jack squat with it. That's what mine says. After a long time, the master, where am I at? Where was I at? 19. Well, we got helpful people here at the Gables. And after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents or five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things, meaning you're gonna get rewards. Come, jump on the couch and watch the U beat FSU. The man with the two talents, that's what my Bible says. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I've gained two more. Boom. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come, jump on the couch with us and watch the Marlin. Um, <laughs> come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one Master, he said, I, I, I knew that you're a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seeds. So, so I was afraid and went out, and I've got a lot of excuses. I, I hid your talent in the ground. See, here's, here's what belongs to you. 
His master replied, here's where it gets a little heavy. You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed, meaning I, I lead through others. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers. You should have done something with it is the point so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. It means you didn't do anything. Take the talent from him and give it to the one with 10 talents. For everyone who has will be given more for he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's heavy. You're like, Chris, that just hit me between the eyes. I'm sorry. I'm just the relay dude. A lot of lead pastors will, will cut, not do that last section because they've got to lead you every week. I leave and I, I go back to Nashville. You guys can be mad at me. But that is just really, really tough to hear. But I want you to know there's no guilt and condemnation and shame in this place. It's really about hope and maybe a healthy conviction if we wanna make sure that out of gratitude that we manage the creator's stuff the best that we can. Don't be guilty. Don't feel guilty. That's not from God. The shame is not from God. He just wants you. He wants what's best for you. So relinquish control. He's the owner. It's a big difference. When you relinquish control, you go from entitlement, and I deserve, and I work so hard, that gets you in so much trouble with your finances and so much trouble with your relationships. It's all about me, it's all about, it's all about me. But if you relinquish control and not walk around like this so tight-fisted all the time, but you're like, you're just a, a loving, gratitude-filled person, that turns into, that entitlement turns into contentment. <sighs> Deep breaths. It's not apathy, it's not lack of ambition. It's a condition of the soul while you're moving forward. It's a big difference. That changes everything. You relinquish control. When it comes to relationships, remember this. There, in life, there's going to be conflict. Who here thinks they can control the amount of conflict in your life, right? Yeah, there's gonna be conflict. Write this axiom down. You will love me for this. Put this on your, on your refrigerator. Conflict is inevitable, but drama is a choice. So just focus on what you can control. You can control no drama. You don't have to walk. Let the monkeys enjoy the circus, <laughs> right? Just, it's gonna be conflict in your life, but tone that drama down. Relinquish control, only focus on what you can control. Turn number two, choose gratitude. Choose gratitude. You can be resentful or you can be grateful. Look to your neighbor and say, I'm grateful. Kendall, go ahead. Doesn't that feel good? Feels good, right? Now look to your other neighbor and say, I am so bitter. <laughs> How's that working for you? That's not fun. There's some people, man, they don't choose gratitude. They walk around with a resting bitter face. <laughs> and they look miserable all the time. Some people are like, I'm happy, I promise. I'm like, can you please notify your face? <laughs> Folks, what do we have to complain about? Think about where we live in the world today. More opportunity than anywhere else in the world. If you make over $34,000 a year, you're in the top 1% of the world's wealth. If you make over $11,000 a year, you're in the top 14% of the world's wealth. What do we have to complain about? You know, you see yourself a lot through your kids. Those who have kids, you know what I'm talking about? I'll take them to a restaurant, one that I would never be able to go to as a kid, and they snub their nose up the food. I'm like, that's a $14 plate. Like, ew, it has tomatoes on it. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, you will eat it. I will put, I'll stuff this in your mouth, in Jesus' name. Right? And then I'm like, oh, that's me. That's me in 14-year-old flesh. $100 shoes ain't good enough. Sorry, this is like therapy for me. Okay. <laughs> Write this down. This is good for you. Grat uh, gratitude is not a situation thing. It is a heart thing. I know people that are way below the poverty line that are so stinking happy and so filled with joy. And I know people that are filthy rich and miserable. 
It is not a circumstance thing or a situation thing. It is a heart thing. I saw, you know, this great theological source that we all know called Twitter. I was on Twitter the other day and saw this uh, great halftime speech by a Down syndrome kid who was just bringing it and slinging it. And at the end of his big deal, he goes, he used this line, and make sure you guys write this down because this is so good. He said, the only disability in life is a bad attitude. And that is so true. We can control that. So choose gratitude. Turn number three, be incredibly generous. Be incredibly generous, and I'm actually convicted about this one because even this morning, as I'm getting out of the hotel and I'm going down the elevator, there's like four or five people, it's a really small elevator, four or five people are already waiting there. I'm like, this is gonna be the most awkward sixth floor all the way down, stopping at eight o'clock in the morning, stopping at every, this is gonna be, oh, so I just get so awkward with people. And, uh, and I just was not looking forward to this, and I, at least I had Annie, like, I mean, Annie and I can stare at each other. Like, what are we doing staring at each other, right, I'm talking? But you know how we do that? You're like, don't do eye contact. So we get in the elevator with all these people, and I'm like, and sure enough, it's stop at every floor, and I'm like, and everyone's kind of like, uh, uh, uh. like, when do we start grunting like that as people? Like, huh, uh. Like, everyone's miserable. Like, you just look like the most miserable. This one guy gets on the second floor as we're going down, and he's like, hey, guys, how's everyone doing? I'm like, oh, and I'm carrying my Bible. I'm like, I'm the pastor. And I'm like the most miserable person in there. I'm like, I just looked like, a, I wasn't really miserable, but I looked miserable. But anyway, I could have been generous with my like energy, could have been generous with a smile, could have been generous with creating, not weird energy, but I could have at least brought some energy. Anyway, John 10.10 10 says this, the most fun you'll ever have with money, check this out. He, he, John 10.10 10 says, I've come to give life and give life to the full. How do we do that? I mean, he's given us this tool called money and our time, and our energy. We could use that to be generous. If you're going after joy by actually looking for things that bring you joy, without, it has nothing to do with serving others, you're going the wrong way about it. There's no thing that's going to fill your tank. When you're grateful for what you've got, it automatically makes you want to give. That's these two go to hand in hand. Gratitude just fuels uh, generosity. They kind of go to hand in hand. Let me give you an example of this. Every sermon needs to have Starbucks in it. So here's a Starbucks story for you. A couple years ago, I went, uh, I was having a horrible morning, and uh, my wife and I were having an intense fellowship. <laughs> um, and uh, I was really mad. I stormed downstairs, and my kids were being bra um, less than ideal. And uh, I was just so fed up, and I sped out of the driveway and just headed down the highway, and I was just irate. And um, next thing you know, I hit dead stop traffic. Not only did I hit dead stop traffic, but the drink that was in my hand now went all over my pants. Khakis, just gonna say. It was awkward, it was awful, like completely all over the place. So I didn't get much sleep the night before, I was tired, what do you do when you didn't get much sleep the night before and you're tired? Everyone in America goes to Starbucks or someone else, somewhere else, but this is happened to be Starbucks. And the worst place that you go for Starbucks is that line that wraps around the building. Yeah, that'd make you even more mad. So I finally get up to the window and this barista sticks his smiling face out the window. I just wanted to shut his face up. I mean, again, in Jesus' name. <laughs> and... Uh, he smiles and he says, uh, gives me my drink and gives me my napkins, and then uh, I go to pay. And uh, he goes, actually, sir, uh, the people in front of you paid for you, so you're good to go. And I was like, bam, what? I was like so excited. And uh, immediately, I didn't have to think about it. Immediately, I was like, well, I want to give for the people behind me. I, I didn't even have to think about it. When you're grateful for what you got, it just makes you want to give. So I offered, and they said, that'll be 863. I said, 863? What are you drinking back there, liquid gold? <laughs> the world, woman. So I reluctantly gave my $10 bill. He gives me my change. I'm kind of looking at him like, am I a big deal right now? Like, I'm pretty generous, right? Does this happen all the time? Thinking he was gonna say, no, you're awesome. He goes, this happens all the time. We actually like to count how many cars it's gonna keep going. And I was like, whatever, just give me my change, I'm good. <laughs> And uh, what I realized, folks, is when I'm leaving the Starbucks, I'm not only leaving with a fresh drink, I'm leaving with a fresh attitude. And keep in mind, my drink was three bucks. I paid eight. 
and I'm leaving happier in a better mood. That's what giving does. It literally, did you know there's a Starbucks verse in the Bible? There is. There is. Proverbs 11.25 says this, the generous will prosper. Then it says, those who refresh others themselves are refreshed. There it is right there. Folks, I couldn't help, but I just realized that I was leaving that car, that line, and just like, I'm in a better mood. <sighs> That's great. I still got wet pants, right? I couldn't help but look in the rearview mirror. The chick was doing the whipping nene back there. She was all, all about it. She was excited. Now, Winston Churchill says it, said it the best. Check this out. We make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. It's a big difference. So I don't know what your future holds, what you're trying, to, what you're going after, or how much joy you want. I, I think that's something that everybody wants. But you are not gonna be able to shape your life filled with joy. This is what you're gonna be able to do. Shape habits that shape your life. Focus on what you can control. You can shape habits that will shape your future. Now, I told you earlier that I didn't have a stable dad growing up. And over the years, that's uh, been hard to reflect on. But over the years, that Psalm 68, God is, God is my father, has really resonated with me, and I, I feel like I'm good now. But I look back at the years, and I, I, you know, I see like supervisors and just different leaders in my life and teachers and coaches that have stepped up. I had some major fatherhood gaps in my life and they stepped in and they were the father to the fatherless to me. God used them in a powerful way so I'm so eternally grateful. Well, recently around my house, there's been a little girl hanging around my house who's a little bit older than my boys. And I'm like, oh, soft-spoken girl, huh? Yeah, right, cougar. So I invited her over to the house. I got to get to know a little bit more about this girl. And so I'm asking her, we're watching a ball game. My, my wife and the kids are kind of uh, making the food in the kitchen. And I'm asking her about her life. And it turns out her name is Hannah. She's one of nine kids. And uh, I ask her about her family. And she says this to me. She, I couldn't believe what I heard come out of this girl's mouth. She said, my mom and dad no longer live together, but they're not divorced. Of course, I was confused by that. I said, why? She said, because daddy died in a car accident two months ago. I couldn't help but think this little girl's world has just been shattered in an instant. She's just been made fatherless. As I sat there with my jaw on the floor and she's wiping tears from her eyes, I felt like God whispered to my spirit, hey, she's gonna have some gaps in her life. I need you to fill them. I didn't know what that meant. Obviously, at that point, I'm just sitting there. I can care less about the game. I can care less about my kids' nightly showers. Over the next couple weeks, I realized that God wasn't asking me to do anything real huge. He's just saying, hey, next time you're going to the park, stop by and pick Hannah up. The next time you're going to church, pick her up and take her to church with you. Include her. Maybe invite her over to the house and throw some extra burgers on the grill. Maybe it's just standing right next to the trampoline and watching her do 416 more tricks on the trampoline. That's the best one ever, Hannah. My wife and I have been doing this for now for months and months and months, and we are absolutely loving it. It's taking nothing out of us. Why? Because when you're grateful for what you've got, it just naturally makes you want to give. Those who refresh others themselves are refreshed. And I'm telling you, our spirit is so refreshed, it brings me so much more joy than I could ever buy. You ever go to a missions trip or do a serving Saturday and you're at the end of it and you're tired and you're like, oh, that was more for me than it was for them. Hannah recently wrote me a letter and I'll end with this. It's pretty dilapidated because I carry it with me a lot. Dear Holly and Chris, I just wanted to thank you for bringing me home these past Wednesdays. I also wanted to thank you for taking me to dinner with y'all. Y'all, that's you all. In that. <laughs> it means so much. I just wanna tell you how much I appreciate you guys for bringing me home and 
taking me to Payway. It's so fun to be around Max, Jack, and Annie. I appreciate everything you've done. Your daughter, Hannah. There's no money, there's no thing I could buy. If you're looking for real joy, it's gonna come out of generosity. Your time, your energy, your money. Those of you that already have it, you know that's where it's coming from. It's coming from you being a generous neighbor, you being a generous nephew, a generous uncle, a generous grandma, a generous uh, member here at Christ's Journey. So if you're looking for joy today, which stats say that many of us are, relinquish control, choose gratitude, and be incredibly generous. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the privilege to be able to manage for you. Thank you for the responsibility that you believe in us and you trust us enough to do that. And God, thank you that there's rewards that when we're faithful with little, your word tells us that you can trust us with much. I'm thankful for Christ's journey. Everyone that attends here, their openness and willingness to hear your scriptures and to be challenged and to be in a healthy way convicted. And I'm thankful for Christ's journey corporately as a church body, living this stuff out, being debt free so that they can be mobilized and have the margin to be able to serve the least of these and to be able to expand into places like Miami Beach. God, we love you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you all. If you enjoyed the content you saw today, I want to invite you to subscribe, comment, like, and even share it with someone you know. And if you'd like to connect with us a little bit further, I'm leaving our link to the website in the description below. You can connect with us there, find out a location, maybe we're right near you, and find out any upcoming events that we might have. See you soon.